Now, it's taken 20 years, two times in jail, and a brutal beating by the police for Anwar Ibrahim to be here. A prime minister in waiting, the chance to transform Malaysia into a democratic country. But it also comes at a time when democracy itself is being tested around the world. So it is a very difficult time for you to be bringing back democracy into the country. Dr. Shri Anwar Ibrahim, a pleasure to see you again. One election does not make a democracy. What will it take for Indonesia to have, for Malaysia rather, excuse me, to have an entrenched democracy? Precisely, uh, we acknowledge that fact. We have seen failures of democracy, fragile, because of the poor uh, effort to build institutional, uh, to ensure there is institutional reform. Um, we, the victory is unprecedented. We have seen the rise of fascism in many parts of the world. But in Malaysia, the effort is a total Malaysian effort. Majority Muslims, Indians, Chinese, indigenous tribes just wanted change. And this is this hope. So it is the duty of the leadership of this new government to ensure that we build institutions strong enough, formidable enough, that nothing would allow nothing, not to return to authoritarianism in the guise of democracy, but to build strong institutions that protect democratic accountability. When I spoke to Mahathir Mohamed before the elections, he said there was a 50-50 chance. Were you surprised by the victory? And what did it mean to you? He was uh, working uh, with the electorate. I was in prison, so I was more optimistic. <laughs> 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 Probably I had little choice. <laughs> but, but I was looking at the uh, uh, progression, the antecedents of history, the, the movement from 2008, election 2013, where we garnered 52% of the popular vote, but did not get in. And with Mahathir's return into politics, and of course it is a difficult, painful decision for me too, uh, I'll be honest to remark that. But then, we have a larger interest. We wanted democracy, we want institutional reform. We love our country. And if nothing's done, then I thought that Malaysia would go downwards. So um, I believe at that stage that Mahathir's contribution would be quite pivotal too. From the 52%, we just need the 3 4% extra, particularly to win over the majority Malays in the rural heartland. But it took an alliance with Dr. Mahathir, who put you in jail for a very long time, but for, are... for, for you to realize the dream for the nation. I, I mean, what was the turning point? What made you do that? Aslinda, these are post-normal times. You have seen presidents supposed to protect trade, I mean, the free trade, ops for protectionism. We have uh, countries with, with the uh, communist legacy, for um, free trade. So it is not uh, odd to find Anwar then embracing Mahathir and working together. It is post-normal times, but it is for the great good of Malaysia and democratic transition in the world. All is forgiven? Truth be told? Yes, because I think there's a larger agenda. Okay, Anwar suffered, the family suffered, yes, but then the country suffered. Between Anwar and the country, I think the country takes precedence. How has it been so far in this journey towards democracy and greater governance in Malaysia? Have you been satisfied with how Mahathir has handled the whole journey? Well, credit uh, to Mahathir uh, is because he has that um, clear uh, commitment to undertake these reforms. And uh, people were, of course, cynical uh, initially. But last week, when he tabled the midterm review, he was chanting reformacy seven times. I mean, the reformacy was the movement established to actually battle and, and fight against him. But this man had this uh, commitment. And I think uh, general Malaysians would uh, certainly accept that uh, the fact that Mahathir uh, is now committed to the reform agenda, 
judicial independence, free media, and we have seen that. And of course, a major problem uh, faced by our country is um, the squandering of billions and endemic corruption. We have to be very tough. That's why I prefer to use the term democratic accountability than just a movement towards democracy. Let's talk about democracy and Islam. Some people in the West have raised concerns about your deep roots in Islamist policies. We've seen how that's turned out in countries like Egypt, in Turkey. How would you balance the two when you become the prime minister? Why will it work in Malaysia? Mm. It has worked in Indonesia, the largest Muslim country in the world. It has worked in India, although Muslims are minority, but the second largest Muslim population in the world. It has not worked in Egypt because I think probably they're too familiar with the tradition of Pharaoh, too long probably. It will take some time, hopefully not too long. But uh, otherwise, uh, Malaysia, I think, has, has a role to play, to show. It's a showcase of the Muslim world, too, that um, there is compatibility, not so much about Islamist or otherwise, but there are universal values that we uphold. And we won, not just because of Muslim support, we won because of almost total support of the Hindus, the Christians, the Buddhists. And we have to acknowledge that. And, and this, again, is contrarian, uh, runs contrary to the general norm where fascism is not on the rise. And we have this proof, that theory, that uh, the trend now is towards nationalistic or narrow nationalism and fascism. You talk about democracy on the one hand, on the other hand, you have a Bumiputra policy, a policy that favors people of the land, the ethnic Malays. Is there a contradiction in that? Well, let us uh, be clear on the fundamentals. The country has to uh, propel its economy. And to do that, it has to be uh, attractive as a foreign direct, uh, for, for foreign direct investments. Uh, economic policies must be transparent. We acknowledge that. The new economic policy is now rather obsolete because it was uh, envisaged at a particular time where the Malays, the, the, the majority um, in Malaysia, were uh, generally deprived of uh, economic opportunities. But things have changed. The understanding of Malaysia has changed. And I have called for the dismantling of the new economic policy since 2007 because I want the economy to be more vibrant, uh, Malaysia must be competitive. We have the resources, the capacity to, to grow as a vibrant economy. But I'm very strong on the issue of affirmative action. So ultimately, the Malays or the poor, Chinese, Malays, majority of the Malays, Chinese in the squatter, urban squatters or the Indians in the estates will not lose because a country that opts purely for growth and prosperity, ignoring the plight of the poor and the marginalized, will not succeed. And, the, and, and democracy will not work if we do not show enough empathy and concern. So having said that, do you envision a day when the Bumiputra policy is no longer in place in Malaysia? Well, it is now shifting to a large extent because we talk about affirmative action based on needs than based on race. And uh, it, would have, it certainly would take time for the Malays to accept that, because for the last 40 years, they've been indoctrinated with this clear policy to survive means a new economic policy in favor of your race. Now we say that to survive means the economy has to grow, investments has to come in, we have to make all necessary measures, changes in policies to attract the investments, but at the same time, we will not forget the poor and the marginalized. What can the people expect when you become Prime Minister? How will your leadership be different from that of Dr. Mahathir Mohamed? I smile more. <laughs> but otherwise, uh, the policies... <laughs> I'll continue with the policies, uh, which um, is now uh, embarked on upon by, by Mahathir, which is actually the uh, policy of the coalition parties, uh, a reform uh, agenda, and I, I am, my task is to continue, accelerate in the new areas, digital revolution, services sector, which is, of course, in economic sense, uh, a departure 
from uh, the past policies. We talk about Mahathir 2.0. Mahathir is a new man. You spent 10 and a half years in jail. Is this Anwar Ibrahim 2.0? How has time behind bars changed you as a man and as a leader? Why ask difficult questions? <laughs> Uh, you see, ten and a half years is still a short walk to freedom uh, compared to Mandela's long walk. And um, this was incidentally my, my, my uh, rapport with him after I was uh, released from prison in 2004. So many times I was in prison, I got to stay the year, uh, 2004, 2018, 1974. Uh, but um, I think naturally people mature. You age, although I'm not that old, but you age. <laughs> um, and and uh, you read more, you understand more, you reflect more in prison. And you have seen so many others, other inmates, some guilty, some innocent. And, and we are, you, you observe the treatment, Malays, Chinese, Indians, or foreigners. So naturally, my passion for justice is far stronger. My belief in democratic reform and democratic accountability far stronger that I am not prepared to compromise any longer. My um, belief, again, on uh, the necessity for economic reform, for countries to evolve, rid the country of corruption, to be attractive for foreign investment, is, is a conviction. I don't believe there's any other choice. And, and if you see what have changed, yes, more. You are, more humble, you're more forgiving, and you realize that without forgiveness and compassion, the country will not grow, and you will have this inherent sickness in your heart, and I think I want to get out of it. How did you spend time in jail? I know you were a voracious reader. I was in your library soon after you were released, and all the walls were labeled. What did you enjoy most? Sleep. <laughs> But, um, you know, people tend to... Escape. It was solitary confinement. It, it was your solitary confinement. You have, you are, you have your, your freedom, no, no interference in that sense. But, of course, you read as much as possible. You also sing. Um, I mean, some people take the pretentious that, you know, you're very serious. You meditate and read. Not true. I mean, I do meditate. I do read a lot. I have no interaction with people. People can't see me. I can't talk to, I can't talk to them except saying hello to the guards. Um, but I do relax and uh, sing and joke a little. And um, yeah, so, but otherwise read. You read hundreds and books, I mean, hundreds of books. I mean, whatever is written by Kassinger, you read. Whatever well, the report by the IMF, I have to read. Whatever I gather, I read. Uh, some quality books, some mediocre. But everything, I mean, ev I mean all the new uh, writings, uh, Piketty or g the old writing, Rawls or Galbraith that I love, all the old classics, and Shakespeare again, after four and a half times rereading the entire works of Shakespeare. And uh, so my advice to you is that you really find difficulty uh, getting time to read, go to jail and read. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's an upside. Uh, it's, also, it's also inspired you to, be, to work on a book that focuses on slavery, poverty, inequality in Malaysia. Tell us more about that. Why, why is this important? Yeah, due to my passion about uh, freedom and justice, I then did focus towards uh, the end of the, uh, my prison term on the issue of slavery, history of slavery, uh, poverty, and now inequality. And um, I thought that uh, there's no meaning, uh, no sense uh, in talking about freedom and justice. We don't deal with these issues that is uh, inflicting so much harm and suffering to so many lives throughout the world. What are your main concerns today for the world as we talk about anti-globalization, turning back policies which were put in place for the betterment of the world. What are some of your concerns as you prepare to be a leader? Uh, I'm, a, I'm a small guy, village head, and uh, there's so many experts here. I don't, uh, I don't want to be pretentious giving some great ideas. 
uh, was following some of their programs, uh, trade war and uh, digital revolution, and all of this. But I think the, uh, what we, the world needs, of course, some ethical concerns, uh, bring back humanity and in governance, uh, good governance. I think these are central issues that we have to bring back to the world. My dream um, is, of course, to make sure that people see those holding power uh, are there to serve for the good of the majority and not to squander wealth or to inflict harm or injustice in the name of religion or race or ideology. And that is, I think, what we need in this world. On the issue of governance, we have to bring in one of the biggest crises that Malaysia has faced, which is 1MDB, which is still being investigated right now. What contributed to such an injustice in the country? It's the failure of governance. I mean, you allow corrupt leaders to go there and squander as much as possible, and the elites were muted and complicit to the crime. Um, international financial institutions and Goldman Sachs, of course, the name. Um, so many others. I mean, complicit to a crime when you know for a fact that billions have been squandered from the purse, public purse. I mean, I was, of course, then opposition leader. I brought up, I was the first uh, member of parliament to bring up the issue of uh, 1MDB in 2010. But I did not envisage that this uh, squandering would go to this extent. And which means it's an entire failure of our system. The judiciary compromised, the media muted, the enforcement agencies were all in the payroll of the leadership. And worse, the financial institutions, international financial institutions that we depended upon, or leaders in Western governments have been harping about democracy and freedom and justice. Not that they were complicit to the crime, but then they were just seemingly tolerant of the excesses. And I think a lesson that we have learned, first, bring back order to our house, bring back good governance, but also to give a strong message that this must end to, in the country and also the way we do business with um, business entities, financial institutions throughout the world. Realistically, it will take time. In Malaysia's case, when do you see that happening? It's already experiencing difficulty in filling up important positions, whether it is in the courts or in the governance. Temporarily, yes, because we've been in government for six months. But we have done uh, remarkably well. We have uh, 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 appointed key personnel, credible people. There are too many good guys uh, that have been denied their place in government, either in the judiciary or in the media or in the enforcement agencies, or in the leadership. And we have seen the recent budget, more positive for development, uh, committed to making sure that there are adjustments and changes in the rules and policies. But the fundamental issue of uh, the manner, the way to facilitate business, ease of doing business, inviting and, and making, again, uh, making sure that Malaysia remains, an attractive destination for foreign direct investments. I think we are moving very fast. If you can see the reports on index on corruption, index is in business. In six months, we have changed. We have seen this, this major transformation taking place. Dr. Sri Anur Wahim, a lot of people in the audience wonder about your relationship with Dr. Mahathir Mohamad. How would you describe it mm. currently? You are, Candidly. You want a politically correct answer? <laughs> no, we just want then, your perspective on it. <laughs> no, I think, uh, you know, I used to be uh, um, with him. I mean, very close. Um, we had amazingly unprecedented, very close relations with him all the years in the 80s, the 90s. And then it was one of the nastiest battle in modern times in Malaysia. But then, so we had both that uh, experience in hindsight. But again, after we resolved, we were able to resolve because we said, look, we have to work together to save the country. Now, if that is the motive, then I continue 
to have a very good engagement with him. I meet him regularly, at times weekly, uh, long sessions, personal sessions and discussions. I made it very clear that he should be given the full latitude and space to do whatever he wants to do. Uh, I will just support. I'm just now a member of parliament. And, um, and that understanding seems to be going on well. And, and Aziza, my wife, is now a deputy prime minister, my boss. But uh, <laughs> so, so I think uh, contrary to some of the perceptions, because of the bitter battle uh, we had uh, gone through for m almost two decades. People were a bit cynical or suspicious of the fact, the fact that whether these guys are actually working together. But, but frankly, I must say that, to his credit too, we have been, uh, you know, back to old time. We were, when we do chat with, with each other in private, we, we used to I mean, bring back the fond memories of the past we try and erase the nasty part. And you trust him when he says that you will become prime minister in about two years? No reason not to trust him. This was a signed document. He signed. This was an understanding uh, in January, prior to the general elections. And when I was still in prison, I was not part of that arrangement. But this was by all party leaders. And he has been reiterating that point consistently and there's no reason why I should uh, bother to uh, worry because I think for now, given a choice, I wouldn't want to talk about it. You know why? He should be given a free hand, the, the space and the support to undertake these reform measures, which are tough. We have been used to a system of governance for the last 60 years, uh, term democracy but authoritarian. And of course, Mahathir was familiar with that system too. But now he has embarked on a new Malaysia. And I think he should be given all the support possible by all Malaysians. Uh, Dr. Shri Anwar Ibrahim, just one final question. Your vision and your dream for Malaysia in this new dawn for the country? As I said, and I would like to reiterate that I want Malaysia to uh, evolve, to mature as uh, a democracy, strengthening the institutions, which means democratic accountability, to prove that a developing country, a Muslim major majority country, we rid its country of uh, religious bigotry, racism, uh, and, and uh, propel the economy. Because without uh, an economic growth, we can't talk about distributive justice. I don't want to distribute poverty. If you want to distribute wealth, it has to be vibrant growth. And I think, um, and of course, I'm, I believe that um, it is not just economics. We want cultural empowerment of our people too, uh, with these new challenges of artificial intelligence, digital revolution. I think we have to move forward. Prominence in waiting for Malaysia, Anwar Ibrahim, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Sir.